Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, we're going to get started. I'm very happy to introduce our very own Hannah Gibson, Dr. Hannah Gibson. Um, Hannah did her MA and PhD in linguistics here at SAS, and she's now a British Academy postdoctoral fellow with us. Um, she has a double specialism of Bantu languages and dynamic oh. syntax. <laughs> Um, and over, over the course of her PhD research, she's become more and more interested and focused on the importance of language, con- language change and language contact in her field area, um, which has led to a new project, which we're going to hear about today. So, Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the uh, invitation to come and speak. Um, so, yeah, as, as Rachel said... Um, I'm going to be talking about contact and change, and I'm going to be asking some kind of broader questions about language contact and language change, um, but then going to look at some specific case studies um, which relate to a project um, that I'm currently working on. Um, So uh, there's a sort of general consensus that languages uh, can change and that language change can result from um, external factors. So in that context, I'm talking about contact with other languages, um, but also internal processes. Um, So again, talking about kind of grammaticalization processes. Um, But there is little consensus on what exactly constrains these types of processes, the changes that can happen, nor on the interaction between the two types of change, so the interaction between uh, internal processes of change and external factors of of change. Um, In terms of agreement, I think people... Uh, there's quite a lot of agreement that there are no absolute constraints on structural borrowing, so what can and cannot be borrowed, Um, but despite that, there is a kind of um, it appears that borrowing is not entirely arbitrary, so the types of borrowing that take place um, follow some kind of patterns perhaps, Um, this is referred to in the work by Thomas and Kaufman as a borrowability scale, so you might find that lexical items are borrowed more easily than grammatical structures um, very briefly put Um, however, again, even within that context if we observe sort of uh, those patterns, we will still want to ask why is that the case? So why are certain classes um, more easily borrowed than others? And what kind of uh, factors play, play into that? Um, I'm going to be looking at uh, part of central Tanzania. Um, so here highlighted with a sort of orange uh, oval. Um, and the Rift Valley area of central Tanzania is unique Um, in that it is the only area on the African continent where languages from all of the four African language phyla are found. Um, So there's some slight dispute about one of them, which is the Khoisan languages, which are there in blue. Um, But otherwise, you can see that you have um, all of the other three language families are found. So you have Nilo-Saharan, you have Afro-Asiatic, Niger-Congo, and um, the uh, Khoisan languages are found there. Um, against that backdrop, there is a sustained history of language contact between these language families, uh, high levels of bilingualism, multilingualism, and uh, continuing uh, language shift. And um, in terms of what I'm going to be talking, today, talking about today, um, I'm going to be examining language contact and change through the lens of a subset of languages which are spoken uh, in this area of East Africa. Um, so just to sort of give you a, a taste of what's to come, Um, The Tanzanian Bantu language Rangi has an unusual word order in which the auxiliary appears post-verbally. Those of you who uh, knew knew me when I was doing my PhD research here will know that I was working on Rangi, and this is what I sort of started looking at. So you have a construction, uh, as in one, where you have mother will collect water, and you have the auxiliary, uh, sorry, the infinitival verb collect comes before an inflected auxiliary. Um, And this is unusual in the context of East African Bantu languages, where the opposite order, so auxiliary verb, uh, predominates. And it's also unusual for SVO languages, um, to which Rangi belongs, um, which again more commonly exhibit auxiliary verb ordering. So this kind of causes Rangi to stand out from both a comparative and a typological perspective. Um, Rangi is spoken in an area of high linguistic diversity. We'll look more exactly what I mean by that. Um, in a minute, and it has proposed that this feature is the result of contact with non-Bantu languages, so that it's a result of this contact situation. Um, An alternative uh, proposal has also been forwarded, which is that this actually might be better understood as a feature um, resulting from language internal processes, so grammaticalization processes. Um, Having said that, 
Uh, Rangi's not alone amongst Bantu languages in exhibiting this post-verbal auxiliary placement. So by way of background to the project, when I started my PhD, I thought that Rangi was the only language to exhibit post-verbal auxiliary placement. Um, pretty soon after I started my research, I found Mbugwe also did that, which is a language which is spoken nearby. Um, towards the end of my uh, doctoral research, I found Gusi and Kuria. And then in just before Christmas, I found that there were two more languages, Ungureme and Supersimbiti. So as I said earlier on, this project, which started as one and then started as four, has now become a project looking at six languages. Um, and I think I've got yeah, them here. So we've got Rangi and Mbugwe, um, which are spoken in this sort of central area of Tanzania, or north central area of Tanzania, highlighted in the blue here. Um, and then, so they form one cluster. We're going to be calling this the Kondoa cluster, and um, we'll look at that later on. And then the other four languages are spoken up here near uh, Lake Victoria. I'm going to be calling those the Lake Cluster. And as you can see here, so this is a map of Tanzania. Some of those languages are also found on the Kenyan side of the border, so they also cross over into Kenya. Um, so that's the, that's the second set, as you were. Gusi, Kuri, and Goreme, and Supersimbiti. Okay, so in terms of what I'll be doing today, I want to develop an account of this verb auxiliary ordering in this subset of, of languages. Um, and I suppose the sort of origin of that is to say, well, what do these languages have in common that might be able to account for the presence of this marked structure? Um, so as you saw on the previous map, just to go back there, although we can say these languages are close to each other and those languages are spoken in an area close to each other, they're not actually in contact with each other. So we don't have contact between all of the six languages. So we're looking for something in, in common. Um, and I also want to look at uh, the questions I sort of started with. So to what extent might this be considered to be the result of contact, uh, specifically with non-Bantu languages spoken in the area? Uh, and to what extent could it be considered uh, to result from grammaticalization processes, so language internal processes? Um, and I have a few other sort of smaller questions relating to that. I'm going to be looking at what the differences are between these six languages, uh, specifically with respect to this construction. Then I'm going to be looking at other contact features or other possible contact features um, to sort of be able to get a larger picture of what's going on in terms of um, interference between the languages. Uh, looking at possible pathways of change, so possible accounts that could be used to, um, uh, possible proposals that could be used to account for this structure. And then what other kind of information might we be looking for to support either account or indeed a combination of the two. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of uh, what we're doing today. Um, a bit of an introduction. I'll then be looking at, it will be quite a sort of data heavy section, so looking at this particular um, ordering. Uh, a bit on the socio linguistic and the historical backdrop, um, which I think is important to sort of try and understand what we're talking about when we talk about change. Uh, proposals to account for it, so again, as I said, a kind of pathway, um, possible contact features, and then what I'm going to do. So this is the beginning of a, of a project, but what other kind of questions I want to be uh, looking at. Okay, so onto the data. I think everyone's got a handout. There's quite a lot of, of data, but um, hopefully that will all be clear on there. And in terms of um, uh, just background, um, tense, aspect, mood, distinctions in Bantu languages um, can be encoded through, com through simple verb forms or complex verb forms. So we have examples here from Swahili. Uh, we have something like, I am going to school, where we have a present progressive marker, na, in the verb form. So I am going to school. A simple verb form. Um, and the example in three, similarly, we cooked food. A simple verb form, and all we have is just a single past tense marker here, li. Okay? So that would be what I'm calling for today's purposes a simple verb form, typically simplex with tense and or aspect marked on the verb form. We also have complex verb forms. Um, now it goes out. We also have complex verb forms, so we have some examples um, from uh, three other languages um, where you have a combination of an auxiliary and a main verb. So the example in four from Hehe, another Tanzanian language, we have um, an auxiliary followed by the verb and have something like we will have bought. So now you're encoding a slightly more um, complex uh, tense aspect distinction. Um, Sorry about the alignment in five. We have we are buying, another Tanzanian language in Gindo. And we have, again, auxiliary followed by some kind of main verb. So here the auxiliary is a kind of do verb, buy, and we are buying, kind of present progressive reading. Um, and finally, we have an example. This is from the PC. Ah! Finally, we have a, an example from uh, Siswati. Um, where we actually have, interestingly, so more than one auxiliary form. Um, so here we have the boys might smoke pot again, and we have, uh, we're going to have three 
we're going to have two blue circles above the words. So I had a little technical problem before I started here. Um, but basically, in terms of the ordering is the thing that we're looking at. We're going to have an auxiliary and another auxiliary and a verb. Um, and if you just look at these examples, you can see that there's already slight variation. So in, so in hey, hey, you have some subject information on the auxiliary and on the verb. So we've got that two on both of those. In Gindo, you have subject information on the auxiliary, but the verb appears as an infinitive, so just there as a ku. Um, and in Siswati, we have auxiliary, uh, the inflection on the auxiliary and the verb here, so we've got ba the whole way uh, along. Um, so just sort of looking at that, we have slight variation in subject marking. We have variation in terms of the number, but also the form of the auxiliary. And despite that, this uh, the order that uh, dominates across the language family is auxiliary uh, verb, the exception being the six languages that I'm going to be looking at today. So the first language um, is Rangi, and just to give you some sort of broader background, this is our auxiliary constructions, our complex constructions. Um, in seven, we have that ill person has died, and we have an auxiliary form Let's see where the circle goes. Yes, we have an auxiliary form, uh, ri, there, which is inflected also for subject information and past tense information. But then we have the, ma the verb coming after that. So this ill person has died. Um, so these are past perfect examples. We'll have exactly the same in eight. We have our auxiliary followed by the main verb. So this is this sort of shows you that in Rangi we do have this order. We do have auxiliary verb. We do have um, what we have here. Um, and that would be more common across the language family, across Bantu languages, and across East Africa. Um, however, in two tenses, in the immediate future tense and in the general future tense, this order is inverted. So in nine, you have we will plant banana plants, and you have the verb plant comes before the auxiliary. Okay, so we will plant banana plants. This is some kind of immediate future, some kind of incipient action. We will plant banana plants just now or very soon. Um, and then a general future, which is a much more general, not specific in terms of time, you will open these beehives. And again, we have the verb first, open, followed by an inflected auxiliary there. Um, and just to show you that an attempt at changing that order um, is not acceptable, we have example 11 with an intended reading of something like, I will cook food, using our auxiliary, ri and attempting to put the verb afterwards and it results in ungrammaticality. So this is actually, this is sort of a grammatical um, encoding, this is how the future tense constructions are formed in these languages, in this language. Uh, a very similar case in Mbugwe, so we have our simple tenses like we saw at the very beginning from Swahili where you just have past tense marker, um, so in the example in 12, I cultivated my farm in this case last week, uh, we have a past tense marker and similarly in 13, I will not talk to you. We have a future tense marker, just that ja there. So this is a simple construction, simple verbal tense. Um, and then you have the ones that are formed through auxiliaries. Um, so in 14, we have a present progressive construction. Uh, the visitor is ill. So I suppose the English translation of that doesn't necessarily sound present progressive, but this is something like um, the illness of the visitor is biting. Okay, so you have auxiliary, uh, sorry, you have the verb, followed by the auxiliary. Uh, so that's how you form the present progressive in Mbugwe. So a combination, a complex construction of a verb followed by auxiliary. Uh, we have exactly the same in the p recent past progressive. He used to refuse beer, he used to refuse to drink beer. We have our uh, verb here, refuse, followed by an auxiliary, uh, a different one here, we have re. And finally, in the present habitual, do you eat fish or do you eat fish? Uh, we have our uh, main verb here, eat, followed by the auxiliary. Um, and just to put point on Mbugwe, uh, there are actually other tenses that, that uh, show this ordering, but each one uses a different auxiliary. So the present progressive is specifically formed with the auxiliary kende, um, the recent past progressive specifically with that auxiliary and some inflection and habitual always uh, employs this, this auxiliary. So, so far we've got our Rangi and Mbugwe examples, so those were the uh, languages which are in sort of central area, which were coded originally in blue. Um, and then we also find the same um, verb auxiliary ordering in the, other, in the other languages, so up near the lake. Um, 
As I'm sort of going through the languages, you'll see that the state of description and the data that I have access to uh, sort of varies. So I worked on Rangi, um, there's someone else, and quite a lot of work has been done on Bugwe. As we get on to Gusi, there's less, so my examples are sort of, there's a less rich source of, of examples. Uh, and similarly, as we go on, you'll sort of see some of that in the data. Um, so here we have what's been described as an untimed fact or occasional habit. Um, and again, we have our main verb followed by an auxiliary. Um, and similarly, in a present continuous example in Gusi, we have a main verb followed by an auxiliary. Um, the only difference here in these two forms, actually, uh, in the case of Gusi, is that there's this ra marker on byte here. So this is the only distinction that you actually see um, between these two. And there's also some uh, a change in the, in the tone marking. Um, so we have something like uh, 18, I am unfolding the blankets, a present continuous event. So again, we've got this uh, unusual uh, word order, this verb followed by an auxiliary. Um, and in, uh, actually in Gusi in a number of tenses, so we also have it in the example in 19, you were biting, this is a hodernal pass, so you were biting earlier on, but earlier on today. Um, and we have our verb followed by uh, an auxiliary. Um, and similarly, the last one here we have is a past habitual um, construction, and it's uh, the verb followed by the auxiliary, but this is a different auxiliary now, so the habitual is formed similarly like we saw in Mbugwe, a different auxiliary used for different tenses. Gusi, there's not a complete one-to-one -one mapping, but this is a different auxiliary from the one we used to up there. Um, so that's like 20 I was harvesting, some kind of past habitual action. So we've seen so far uh, Rangi and Bugwe. This is Gusi, so this is the first language on our kind of lake cluster. Uh, a neighbouring language spoken in that area is Kuria, um, and I've identified this ordering in at least two tenses, um, possibly more. Again, this kind of now comes to a state of, of description. So people saying, "Oh, I can't go into all of the auxiliary constructions; it's too complicated." So what I have here is is what I know so far. Um, so present progressive, we have our main verb. Uh, again, followed by the auxiliary. So they read, they are reading, um, and similarly with a simple present, he or she is becoming injured. Um, so here again we have a, a tonal distinction on the final vowel there. Now these examples from Gusi, but also from Kuria, also have a little marker at the front. So here it's glossed as, as focus. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on in terms of what that might mean for information structure. Um, but this presumably comes from some kind of um, structure which was like a cleft construction. So this would have been, it is reading I am or something like that. But it seems that that's um, fossilised now. And again, I don't have the specifics of if you can have that without a focus marker, is that then a focused verb? They are reading, not something else. Um, but those are the kind of questions that I'd like to look at um, in more detail. Uh, so that's uh, Korea, and then on to um, one more language. So if you're following on the, the data, um, then this is on page 5, uh, 2.6, Ungureme. Uh, we have a, a, a number of tenses. We have a present progressive tense construction here. I am singing, uh, verb followed by the auxiliary. Um, so we have sing, again we have that little focus marker, uh, we have an infinitive marker, um, and this uh, auxiliary here I've actually glossed as a locative auxiliary, so this is the way that you would also say I am at school or I am in the room or something like that, so it's almost like singing I am at. Um, so that's a sort of what I'm calling here so far anyway, a locative auxiliary, um, which contrasts slightly with what we have in the present progressive, again our verb, with an infinitive marker, a focus marker, but we have this auxiliary re. So these two have two different uh, auxiliaries are used, uh, one with some past tense information and one some kind of locative auxiliary. Um, now, the language that I presented so far, I showed actually that there was a Rangi example which was ungrammatical if you changed the order around. And it seems that in, in Goreme, at least in the past progressive, there's actually some flexibility of word order. So that's another in, uh, interesting area for further inquiry. So here we have what we're not allowed in the other languages and what we're not allowed in the other tenses, which is the auxiliary coming before the verb. And in this, in terms of what we have as a translation, he or she was waiting and I was singing. We don't actually have much to distinguish between those and they're both considered to be past progressive examples. So that's sort of interesting in terms of in other tenses, those were completely ruled out. 
And in this tense, at least, it seems that those two structures are coexisting. Um, so I, I can talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Um, and our final um, uh, example, our final language here is uh, Suba Simbiti, um, where you have uh, this ordering in the present progressive. So 26, something like we are digging, uh, with a verb, an infinitive, and our focus marker, or our historical focus marker, and our auxiliary. Um, and we also have a present habitual construction uh, verb here. Interestingly, there's a habitual marker on the end. So if you think of uh, an uh, infinitive, typically we think of them, or we might think of them as not hosting tense aspect information. We certainly might think of them as not hosting subject information. Um, but here you have uh, infinitive with a habitual um, marker on it as well. But again, this consistent verb auxiliary order as something like we are dancing, we dance, we, usually, we are usually dancing. Okay, so a bit of an overview, kind of um, interim summary of what we've got so far. Rangi, this ordering is found in two tenses, and the two tenses use different auxiliaries. So we have two tenses, two auxiliaries, and they are ri and ise. Mbugwe, we have six tenses which exhibit this order, six different auxiliaries, and there's a one-to-one -one match, so one different auxiliary is used in each of the tenses. In Gusi, we have five tenses where this has been identified, but two auxiliaries. So actually, I think in four of the tenses it was, it's re, and in one of them alone it's this renge one. So you can also ask about the relationship between those two. Um, in Kuria, I have so far two, but I put a question mark because there might be more. Um, one auxiliary is consistently this re. Uh, ngareme, two tenses, two auxiliaries, and that's the form. Uh, and then Suba Simbiti, two tenses, and the same uh, auxiliary is used in both forms. So we've got, even within this sort of construction, we've got a little bit of variation um, in terms of the number of tenses, in terms of the auxiliary forms that are used, um, and the overlap. So some of them have a one-to-one -one match, some of them don't. And on here I could also show um, that, for example, in Mbugwe, all auxiliary constructions have this ordering. In Rangi, not all auxiliary constructions have this ordering. So there are also other auxiliary constructions which don't have uh, verb auxiliary. Um, okay, so that, I think, is um, the sort of the data side of things. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the sociolinguistic background and the historical backdrop. Um, so I said that these are um, languages spoken in two, sort of, uh, two areas. Um, so what I'm calling the Kondoa cluster, this little, well giant, really, red triangle, um, is Kondoa, so a town in central Tanzania. And the first circle that comes up here is Rangi, and the second one is um, Bugwe. Um, and in terms of this map, um, so this just shows you a little bit about the language families as well. The Bantu languages here are coded in green. Uh, the Cushitic are a very sort of light purple, so some around here. Uh, Nilotic are this much darker, stronger purple that you have up there. And what, are, what have uh, sort of disputedly uh, Khoisan languages, we have Sandawe and Hadza there, so a kind of lighter yellow. I know that doesn't show up brilliantly on there. So this is our Kondoa cluster. We've got Rangi oh, and uh, Mbugwe spoken here. Now, in terms of sort of the historical picture, uh, this area of central Tanzania has a long history of language contact. So the Cushitic languages that are present there today have been estimated to have entered the, the area some 3,000 years ago. Uh, Bantu languages, something like a thousand years later, um, but uh, like Datoga, which is a Nilotic language, actually much more recently. So you've got a sustained sort of history of language contact between languages from different families, very different language types in terms of syntax, in terms of all sorts of um, all sorts of sort of in all sorts of domains. Um, but this kind of long history of uh, contact, and that's kind of played out um, in this quote we have here which says that all linguistic observations of Bantu and Cushitic languages in the area indicate that there has been significant interaction, and indeed interference, between the language groups. Um, so now we're sort of looking at, well, what is the nature of that? What kind of change are we looking at? What kind of contact are we looking at? Um, just to bring you up to date with the sort of present-day situation, so Kondoa town, where I had that red triangle, and the surrounding areas, there are some 40 languages spoken in that area. Um, uh, Presently, they include, so we have Cushitic languages, Iraku, Burunge, Gorwa, and Alagwa. Uh, we have Nilotic languages, Datoga, Maasai, uh, Khoisan language, Sandawe, and then the Bantu languages, Rangi, Mbugwe, Goga, and Chaga. Now, there are lots of other languages 
that are spoken by people who live there. Swahili um, is also a dominant language uh, throughout East Africa. It has official language status in Tanzania, so it's spoken on a day-to-day basis. Um, but these are sort of languages in terms of um, well, I'll talk a little bit more about the kind of actual interaction between the language uh, language communities. But these are the kind of languages which have a strong uh, foothold in the area and have done for some some time. Um, so to just narrow in on this Kondoa cluster, we have Rangi, uh, which I think is yeah, which is this sort of spoken in this whole area. So Kondoa town is here. Uh, Dodoma, which is the capital of Tanzania, but sort of administrative uh, capital of Tanzania. And then Arusha, which is a big city, um, sort of closer city to Kenya, so it's also very important in terms of trade, right at the top there. And there is the Dodoma-Arusha road, which connects them. And Kondoa is a sort of a town almost halfway between the two. From about 60 kilometres south of Kondoa to about 60 kilometres north of Kondoa, the villages are Rangi-speaking villages. But the south side, you have Rangi and uh, Burunge speakers. So on the south side of Kondoa, the villages are mixed. You have households where people speak Rangi and Burunge at home. You have neighbours who speak the different languages. So these are the two sort of primary languages which are in contact there up to today. And then as soon as you go north of Kondoa, Alagua, another Cushitic language, has a stronger sort of foothold. And then you find these mixed villages, if you will, being Rangi and Alagua as you go further north. In terms of uh, Mbuk, uh, uh, and then you have another Cushitic language here, which is Gorwa, which actually spreads in a much wider um, area, but that's sort of up at the north there. And then you have uh, Mbugwe, the much smaller speech community, um, spoken uh, around the town of Babati. Um, and this is in contact uh, up to today with Iraku, so one of the large Cushitic languages there. Also Maasai, but that's actually this whole sort of area. Um, and I sort of pointed to it earlier on, but as you can see, Technically or historically, the Mbugwe and Rangi speaking communities are separated by the Gorwa and Iraku speaking communities. So these two Bantu languages are actually entirely surrounded by non Bantu languages. Um, having said that, Rangi and Mbugwe are presumed to share a common predecessor language, so some kind of proto Rangi Mbugwe. Um, they're supposed to have derived from a common source in terms of the sort of more um, ethnographical and anthropological perspective these communities are supposed to have moved together and then split either one account says after the battle with the Gorwa, so after the battle with this community, or um, at a later stage when they travelled south um, in search of water and ended up, the Rangi ended up in the town here, so Kolo and Haubi are the centre of the Rangi speaking communities. Um, The late cluster um, so this is what's on this map anyway, called Lake Victoria. Um, we have this whole area, um, and also, sorry, onto the Kenyan side as well. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it is a kind of factor in the picture. Um, and what you have here is actually a really high concentration of Bantu languages. So actually all of these little uh, lines here are Bantu languages. Um, you have Nilotic languages, so that's the dark purple um, but in contrast to down here, you don't have Cushitic languages. So again, even if we're looking at contact in two separate instances, they're not even with the same uh, language groups. Um, having said that, yeah, high concentration of Bantu languages in a small area along the lake. Um, a, hista- a sustained history of language contact, particularly with the Nilotic languages, Luo, um, Maasai uh, and Datoga. Um, and then a strong Nilotic presence specifically in Kenya as well, and I just said that, there's no sort of strong Cushitic presence in the region. Um, in terms of the contact languages, um, this, is, this picture is slightly different from the Rangi and Bugwe uh, story, because what I've done here is the languages in bold are contact between unrelated language families. So Gusi is in contact with Luo. Gusi is a Bantu language, Luo is Nilotic. Um, the same down here. Kuria is also in contact with Luo, Ngureme with Datoga, and Soba Sambiti with Luo. However, the Bantu languages, these four Bantu languages, are also in contact with each other. 
So as you can see here, Gusi is in contact with the other three in the study. Uh, Kuria is also in, in contact with Gusi, obviously, uh, conversely. So whereas with the Rangin and Bugwe, we were looking at perhaps two separate, perhaps a common language, a uh, common contact language, here we could also be looking at a sort of different situation where it's gone from Nilotic language and then between the Bantu languages. Um, so this is, yeah, this just kind of shows you where they are um, and that they're in a close sort of, they're also in contact um, with each other. Um, and here we do have the Kenyan side, so here we have, um, just to show you this, Nilotic languages here as well, so that would be the Tanzanian area, this is Lake Victoria again, um, so this is Gusi and Kuria spoken on this side of the border as well. So they basically sort of form a chain, these languages, um, one next to, uh, next to each other. Okay, so it's all very well to say languages are in the same contact, there's lots of multilingualism, there's lots of bi bilingualism, but that's not enough to then be able to account for the presence of a particular structure or a feature that you consider to be contact feature. You actually want to see, well, what could be the source for this, what could be the source of borrowing or interference. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I started with, so what the initial focus of the research was, this order, but I'm also going to look at other possible contact features. Um, so, verb auxiliary order in Rangi and Mbugwe, so in those Kondoa cluster languages. Um, the two Cushitic languages spoken there, Iraku and Goa, both have a rigid SOV word order, um, and they have a periphrastic future construction in which a verbal noun precedes an auxiliary, a go auxiliary, to form a future tense. So when I was looking for sources of verb auxiliary order in Rangi, especially when I was only looking in Rangi, I thought this was great. This was, uh, Rangi is in contact with Gorwa, uh, and, okay, this is data from Iraku, but this seemed like a really good candidate. Um, so you have an example in 28, that animals will drink water, and you have a verbal noun for drink, so drinking, um, and then you have that followed, so that's exciting for my purposes, followed, by the auxiliary. So here we've got verb auxiliary order in a contact language, in a Cushitic language that's spoken in the area. Uh, great. Similarly in 29, tomorrow we will not go to work. Uh, we have, uh, so actually this is a doing, a verbal noun, and then followed by an auxiliary. Um, so these seem to be possible candidates for um, for sort of a contact uh, induced account of that verb auxiliary order in Rangi, their contact languages, um, and they have this order. Um, so the question is, is this a possible source um, of transfer for um, a verb plus auxiliary in Rangi and or in Bugwe? Um, and the answer is maybe, but still not sure. Uh, Martin Maus, uh, who this, this data came from, um, noted that these examples are actually really marginal, even in Iraq. There were other ways of forming a future tense, there are other constructions. So, not that that in itself means, okay, because they're marginal they can't have been a source, but it does sort of put some question marks over, over that. You would want a construction, you would imagine a construction to be more widely used, um, or pervasive throughout the language, especially if it's going to then be a, something, a sort of candidate for a contact um, induced change. And we also know that more kind of cross-linguistically, uh, movement verbs such as go are often involved in uh, grammatical grammaticalization processes and encoding future tense. So maybe this is actually a case of grammaticalization in Iraku and that the other forms are more common. Um, and yeah, the, there are it's not also clear in Rangi whether, for example, the, the origin of the auxiliaries, whether any of them are something like go, which might kind of add to this, if you want to think of it as kind of grammaticalization or even aerial grammaticalization. So there's some kind of question marks over that, and as yet I don't have other possible sources for this ordering as such. Um, but there are other um, features in, some, in the languages which I consider to be good candidates for... Uh, contact features. So one of them is uh, clusivity distinction in Rangi. So uh, Rangi first person plural possessive pronouns have a distinction between inclusive and exclusive. So you have an example like 30. Today I angered our grandfather and when I'm saying our ah, I mean mine and my siblings and my other family members and I don't mean yours who I'm talking to. Um, so this is not yours. So this is an exclusive um, possession. So today I angered ours, not including yours. Um, contrast that to 31. So sorry, that's, uh, that's that one. Contrast that to 31. The death of our relative in Kondoa 
And now I'm talking about R, and it's also the person that I'm talking to. So this is an inclusive possession, uh, the death of both mine and your uh, relative in Kondoa. Um, so the reason I've sort of touched on this is that including a inclusivity distinction, um, sorry, is that um, including a inclusivity distinction such as this is not attested in any of the other neighbouring Bantu languages that I know of, nor is it found in the Bantu language more widely. Um, it's only found in these possessive pronouns as well, so you don't find it m any kind of marking on the verb, so it's a really restricted use, and it's only in the first person, uh, and, sorry, it's only, it's only in this, and it's not in the absolute, absolute personal pronouns, so there's no distinction in, like, we, it's only possession. Um, so, is this a contact feature? Um, not found in Bantu languages, that sort of s points in that direction. Um, now, it's been... Uh, proposed by um, Filimova, Filimonova in a book on inclusivity that Iraku is one of the few languages in Africa that has this inclusivity distinction, so that's one of the languages that would be a possible contact feature. However, I haven't found data supporting the presence of that in Iraku. So whether she's got that from a source that I've not been able to access, or that's sort of an, uh, that's a, I don't know, say it's a red herring, I hope it's not, but... This is, it seems like a, a good candidate, but again, haven't found the source of, okay, this is a contact language with this kind of distinction, and that's where Rangi has got it from. Um, so again, the picture's still um, quite murky in that regard. Um, another story that I hope is a bit more sort of robust um, is cause final negation. So again, looking at possible candidates for contact features. Um, so negation in Rangi is, uh, verbal negation in Rangi is marked um, through a negative marker C and then tuku, which appears either after the verb or clause finally. Um, so we have in 32, today our friends did not come, and we just have our C negative marker there, and then we have our, uh, that one comes immediately after the verb, so today our friends did not come. Um, and in 33, the chicken will not give us eggs, we have a negative marker, and then we actually have the negative marker completely at the end, so not immediately after the verb. Okay, so this is the case in Rangi. Uh, it's also the case in Mbugwe. Um, slightly different construction in Mbugwe, but they have a negative prefix, te, which appears uh, on, at the beginning of the verbal complex, and then negative marker toko, which optionally appears at the very end. So 34 is something like, we did not run to the hospital at all. Um, it adds a sort of emphatic reading. You can also have it without toko in Mbugwe, um, that would be grammatical, and it would just be, we did not run to the hospital. So, uh, Mbugwe has this uh, optional clause final marker. In Rangi, it's obligatory. Um, and in some joint uh, work with Vera Wilhelmsen, who's working on Mbugwe, uh, we've proposed that these negative markers, Tuku and Toko, in Rangi and Mbugwe, are actually instances of lexical borrowing, which have been incorporated into these two Bantu languages. So, although... Uh, post-verbal negation itself in Bantu is not unusual. The actual form of these negative markers is, uh, suggests that they're examples of lexical borrowing that have been, um, uh, become part of the grammatical structure for negation. And we propose two candidates. One is the Cushitic language Burungay, spoken in the area, in which tuku means entirely or wholly. So presumably you have some kind of negation, we did not run and then you have entirely or wholly or some kind of intensifier at the end, which is again a very sort of common <coughs> pathway for grammaticalization of, of negative strategies. Um, or also a lagua, a Kutishic language spoken in the area, where you have tuku or tuk, which again expresses the completeness of an action. Um, so we think that this is a good example um, for uh, interference between uh, Rangin and Bugwe, so the Bantu languages and neighbouring Cushitic languages, uh, and that it, is, it shows borrowing of a lexical item, uh, even if it's not actually borrowing of an entire negation strategy, but that's been incorporated into these languages. So, just to sort of show you that, the, as well as what I'm sort of have started off by talking about this verb auxiliary ordering, there seem to be other areas in the grammar of the languages where some kind of contact has played a role. Um, also on negation, um, in Korea, there are two negation strategies which at the moment I can't seem to find any difference um, in terms of what they mean or what they do. So you have in 35, they have not read today, and you have a negative marker, just a simple ta, uh, they have not read today, and then in 36 you have a double negation strategy, 
also here at least um, translated um, as they have not read today with a negative marker at the beginning and then again a post-verbal negative marker unbound on its own there. Um, so I would sort of in this context ask, well, does this reflect the fact that there are these two negation strategies that coexist that you find across the tense aspect paradigm, so you find them exactly this distinction in different tenses, does this reflect uh, different stages in, in a grammaticalization process or processes? Um, could we propose that this is also the result of contact-induced change in the same kind of vein as we found or we proposed in Rangi uh, and Umbugwe? So that's also about sort of morphosyntax and about negation. Um, one of the other languages that I'm looking at, Ngureme, has uh, a, a vowel system in which you have seven vowels in nouns, but only five vowels in verbs. Um, so you have minimal or near minimal pairs of nouns in which there is a distinction between the mid vowels but you don't have a uh, distinction between those vowels in verbs um, and Tim Roth who I've been in communication about this with has a corpus of something like or yeah, 1,700 verbs and he hasn't got any examples um, of seven vowels in the verbs um, so the question um, uh, so this is a sort of question, is, okay, well, is this perhaps contact related? Um, and that's, I, I would ask that because I'm looking for, looking for contact. Um, and Bila, which is a Bantu language spoken in Democratic Republic of Congo, seems to have acquired two additional vowels uh, in the verbal but not the nominal system. Uh, and it's been proposed that this is a result of contact. So again, this is a sort of a different area, but just to show that there are other proposals that have been made that a sort of distinction in um, verbs and nouns um, in the uh, vocalic system have been proposed and have been proposed to result from contact. And then coming back to this specific case, uh, Ngureme is in contact with the Nilotic language Datoga, and very nicely for my story, Datoga has seven vowels in verbs and only five vowels in nouns. So that seems to kind of, at least that one on the surface of it, wrapped up quite nicely as, uh, again, another possible example of contact. Um, so we've got sort of what it appears as perhaps um, grammatical sort of morphosyntax, possible um, interference here in the sort of phonology, so in the, in the vocalic uh, inventory. So the question is what other kind of things do I need to look at? What other questions do I want to ask to complete this picture to sort of um, fill it out a bit more? Um, and some of those questions I've already kind of given rise to through data that I've already got. So in Rangi, for example, I showed that order at the beginning. You have verb auxiliary order. But that's only the case in declarative main clauses. In the future tense construction, so remember in Rangi it's just in the immediate future and the general future. In future tense constructions, this order changes round. So in future tense constructions, you get the auxiliary before the verb, which in, uh, sorry, in these contexts I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, so this is the case when it comes after a WH element, so when it's preceded by a WH element. When it's part of sentential negation, which as I mentioned is formed using this kind of C and Tuku brace. If it's part of a relative clause, part of a cleft construction, or if it's preceded by the subordinators Jolly and Corny, so they're very sort of specific <laughs> context. Um, so in the main clauses, in declarative main clauses, auxiliary verb order is simply ungrammatical. I showed the very example very early at the beginning, we will cook, and tempting to do auxiliary verb, and it's not accepted. In these contexts, you ha the order changes, not only is it accepted, but it's, it's obligatory. So the question that I ask then here is, well, if you look at these contexts, to what extent actually is this order the result or related to, at least historically, information structure. So is there something to do with focus going on here? We've got WH questions, um, cleft constructions, again, some kind of contrastive focus would be um, usually conveyed through that uh, sentential negation. You know, it'll, some of the other ones are not quite so clear. But again, what role might information structure play in this? Um, and I pointed out earlier on that in the languages of the lake, so in those four languages, you also have this focus marker, uh, mm, so I was harvesting, and it was harvesting, or it, it is harvesting, I was, something like that. Um, so again, this is a kind of, in terms of information structure, information packaging, that might suggest to you that, okay, well this is actually much more to do with that 
than to do with contact. That might put you towards a grammaticalization account because we want to say, well, actually, this order resulted from it being a cleft construction. It's nothing to do with Cushitic. It's nothing to do with Nilotic. It's actually a language internal process that's going on. Um, so I would want to look um, at the other languages. So I know that's the case in Rangi. I don't yet know about Mbugwe, and I don't yet know about three of the other languages. Gusi, the ordering changes in negation, but I don't know about cleft constructions, I don't know about relative clauses, um, I don't know yeah, about WH questions. So really you would want to fill up the picture with all of those, what I have for Rangi as so-called inversion constructions, for all of the languages, and then also say, well, maybe there are other contexts. Just because I have identified those, you might find other contexts in which that order changes. Um, and then another sort of question um, is, well, what direction or directions is this change taking place in? Um, so in Rangi and Mbugwe, for example, those, the Kondoa cluster, do we want to say that, just focusing for a moment on the verb auxiliary order, is that the result of contact with one common contact language? Or is it the result of contact with two contact languages independently, but they just so happen that the two languages then develop these, um, these orderings uh, independently? Or is it perhaps much older than we think, or older than that would suggest, and the contact between a predecessor of Rangi and Mbugwe and the predecessor of some kind of southern Cushitic language, um, and that then Rangi and Mbugwe kind of developed independently and maintained that in the two languages? Um, and the same question you would want to ask for the languages of the lake, as I pointed out earlier on, that's perhaps slightly more complicated, because do you want to say, OK, this is transfer from Gusi or transfer into Gusi from Luo, but then from Gusi into the other Bantu languages? Or is it transfer from Luo in all instances, or a different Nilotic language in different cases? Um, so the two kind of separate clusters are interesting in that they have some things in common. The reason that I'm looking at them as a sort of subset at all is ordering, but the sociolinguistics are also sort of slightly different. And so that would be on the contact side. And then because I have this kind of ongoing grammaticalization, language internal questions as well, does, this, does actually the presence of a so-called unusual word order in six languages actually suggest, well, it's not so unusual at all? Okay, so it's unusual if you take all the languages of the Bantu family and you only find it in six. But still, six is not one. It's still there's something that is going on in these languages that we want to account for. So again, looking for something that's common in these, and maybe it's a more acceptable or more common pathway of change um, than, than we thought. Um, so in terms of my sort of continued research, as I said, the state of the description of the languages varies. So I want to look also to see if there are other tenses. I pointed to the fact that in Korea, I know it's in two, but I think it might be in others as well. Um, are there other inversion contexts? So the WH questions, negation, relative clauses that do sort of interesting things in other languages, in all of them? And are there additional inversion contexts? So are there other contexts in which that order has changed? Um, and I'd be looking also for other domains, so these other kind of contact features um, that I've pointed to a few of. Um, lexical borrowing um, would be, again, if you talk about a sort of borrowability, if you talk about a scale, people say, well, actually, by the time you've borrowed a grammatical structure, such as verb auxiliary order, you would also expect lots of other types of change to have happened in the language. You'd also expect lots of other instances of interference. Um, I talked a little about the phonology, um, and then also I'd like to look more at sort of morphosyntax. So what about um, other sort of temporal distinctions? Um, in some of the languages, it seems that there's a distinction between past and non-past versus degrees of past, which might be more common. So you want to look at all of these kind of things to see whether those are also um, contact features. Uh, sort of aerial picture confuses things a little bit more. Um, so some of these might be instances of aerial grammaticalization. Um, and then... I presented some kind of sociolinguistic and a little bit of the historical background, but you really want to also have a much deeper understanding of how those things are playing out uh, in the present day and have played out in the past. So you want to look at what exactly characterises these patterns of bilingualism. If these kind of changes are happening, you expect high levels of bilingualism. You expect it not just perhaps for one generation, but you expect it on ongoing. Um, there has been a shift from, for example, Alagua and Burungay, so the two Cushitic languages, uh, Cushitic contact languages from, from for Rangi, um, meaning that 
Lots of Rangi speakers today are ethnic Alagua and Burungay, or um, people are increasingly speaking Rangi as a second language, although then perhaps their children would speak it as a first language. So you've got those kind of patterns um, going on. Um, and then also in the context of Tanzania, I mentioned this a little bit, um, and in the context of East Africa more widely, you also have increasing and ongoing pressure from Swahili. So not only do you have all of these languages in the area, but you also have a kind of much larger language of wider communication kind of um, mapped across the top of it as well, which adds, definitely adds to, um, adds to the picture. Um, and just sort of to bring it back to the questions that I was looking at at the beginning, um, just to sort of say that all of this is done essentially with a view to better understand the process of language change um, and to understand the interplay between language contact, so contact-induced change, uh, and grammaticalization. And by no means am I suggesting that those two can't go hand in hand. So you might find that grammaticalization along this particular pathway um, has been catalyzed by the fact that there is a lot of language contact, that there's high levels of multi bilingualism and multilingualism. Um, and also, um, again, sort of in terms of sort of larger questions, um, looking at the way in which structural transfer, more generally, but kind of with a focus on these languages, is delimited by universal constraints on language change and grammaticalization. So, is it the sort of anything goes model versus no, these things happen in this? Um, and these things can't happen. So what kind of changes can take place and what kind of changes um, can't take place? And I think that's me. Done. Um, thanks, Hannah, very much for uh, such an engaging talk on what appears to be quite a complex, as complicated field of research. Um, no doubt there'll be some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, <clears throat> there's one big question which I, which came straight to me, which, which you didn't refer to at all, uh, and that is, have you established a, any kind of evidence for a genetic uh, relationship between the two language clusters, which in, would imply that all these processes, if there, if there were, that all these processes might have taken place sometime in history, mm. In other words, not be relevant to the particular groups which are there, but, but to some predecessors of them. Uh, um, so is there any genetic evidence of those two clusters being part of one cluster at some time in history? I think, um, so you're absolutely right, I didn't, I didn't mention that. So probably before all of that I should have said that the reason that I was showing the examples from Swahili and some of the wider Bantu languages um, is to point you in the direction that I don't think that this is uh, of sort of genuine inheritance from Bantu inheritance. It's not a kind of longer standing inheritance from proto Bantu. In terms of the link between the two, what I've called the two clusters, um, a long, long time ago, yes. But then um, if I was to um, some kind of map like this, um, you have, I don't know, so the languages where I have the languages of the lake, so the little ones up there, say there's 12 languages there, and I found it in four, and even the neighbouring most closely related languages to Super Sumbiti and Ngureme do not have it on the Bantu side. So what I've sort of done is said, well, it doesn't look like that, because it's only the ones that seem to be... Uh, in, in contact with, okay, that's slightly more complicated, but in contact with a uh, non-Bantu language, or in contact with a Bantu language which is Im immediately in contact with a non-Bantu language. In terms of the relationship between the two clusters themselves, not really. I mean, they're Bantu languages, um, but they're, I think, I don't know if Lutz has a comment to... On, would they be close on the tree, on, on, on the phylogenetic tree? To each other, or would they be quite different? They would be quite. They would be quite far apart, but they would not be as far apart as no. Rangi and Siswati or something. Um, so I don't think. I don't think that that's um, that's the story. But but that's no. That's a really good. Um, you know, that sort of is what the whole thing hinges on, really. Otherwise, yes, they've got it from somewhere else, and all the other languages have lost it, or. Um, Have you looked at the behaviour in, in imperative environments? Uh, is there any impact on the, uh, on the ordering of elements? 
and the second question is, uh, you mentioned lexical borrowing, you'd expect fairly heavy, well, obvious lexical borrowing, what, what, what is the test of Indian language? Um, so, on imperatives, I haven't tested, but in the languages that I do know about, um, so Rangi and Bugwe, you wouldn't form an imperative with a compound construction, so it would be sit, and that would just be a single verb, um, or in climb or something. Um, as soon as it becomes a future tense or a habitual tense, it wouldn't, that, wouldn't sort of, that question wouldn't play out anymore. Um, and there are, so there's growing kind of accounts of lexical borrowing, so there is a list of instances of uh, presumed Cushitic words of Cushitic origin in Rangi, um, Cushitic words in uh, Bugwe, um, and also up, up in the Great Lakes area. I think the thing that struck me most was that what I've done today is present the things that are unusual, but in so many regards, all these languages are so Bantu, they're so prototypically of the language family, and yes, you do have instances of lexical borrowing, you do have words, especially ones that look like very old borrowing, but you don't have many other things. You don't have, I don't know, borrowing of prepositions and no. sort of things like that, so that you would expect in between. You've got some lexical stuff, and then you've got what seems to be some really sort of grammatical stuff. And um, yeah. Um, in pursuing the um, language concept, I would probably just have the ability to, you know, to, to explain this um, in future mm -hmm. class of languages. I even want to consider also internal, another context, another level of context, which is internal variation within the same language. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that came to my attention because I know within the, some languages, uh, which have been in contact with dominant languages, Maasai and Luo, mm -hmm. you might have one dialect, for example, the Ekewu C, the southern dialect of Mogirango, is apparently a lot more influenced by Maasai or Lu mm. than the northern one. And in the case of uh, Suba, <coughs> I think um, by, I think you have a subtitle, it's Suba Simbiti. Yeah, so there's a Suba Simbiti, which is the Tanzanian one, and it's different from the Suba spoken in Kenya. It's particularly the, it's the Kenyan one, yeah. Um, but the two of them are um, heavily influenced by Tolu, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, there will be other instances where you find, uh, for example, the northern Kikuyu has this particular feature of uh, using the verb God and the, to express the future, to grammaticalize it into the future tense, whereas the southern mm. dialect of the same does not. Absolutely. And presumably, that the northern dialect has probably taken this feature from the Nilotic language. Mm. So you may want to, want to consider looking at um, whether the sample, the, the data or the sample that you have which Yeah, no, that's, that's certainly a, a really good point. I mean, even with the Gusi and Kuria, um, so for example, I think I had it on the handout, on Gusi, um, half a million Gusi speakers have Kuria as their first language. Um, and of Kuria, it's also spoken by about a quarter million people in Kenya. And then again, as I sort of showed earlier on, that would be in contact with different languages. And I already know that there are dialectal variations with, within those. So I think the point about actually making sure that I also know which dialect the data are from is certainly really important. And then, ideally, I would like to get data from different dialects within the, within the languages as well, because in terms of the contact, that's, that's vital, because if you can say, well, this is actually much more in contact with language eight. And you also talk about Ake Wusi, I call it Ake Wusi, as a sort of a mediating language, you can, it has, you know, you can transfer from mm -hmm. you know, between the Nilotic and the other branch. I think you should also consider Luhia, mm -hmm. because within that zone, I think Luhia yeah. is a much more yeah. uh, mediating Presence. language than anyone else would have this numerical mm -hmm. science. Yeah, no, certainly. No, that's that's uh, the Luya thing is also is important. Um, and I think with the Maasai, it's interesting because when I talked about, for example, Rangian and Bugwe, we're talking about people living in the same houses or in neighbouring houses. Um, with Datoga and perhaps to a lesser extent Maasai, these are also the Datoga, particularly, are continuingly they're nomadic people. So the type of contact will also be different. Um, it's not necessarily seeing the same kind of, I don't know, family structures, the same kind of transfer to children. And that would be interesting to look at, yeah, up, up, and up at the lake as well, definitely. Thank you. Connor? Um, I had a question about the Mbore. Uh-huh. Um, oh, about the vowels. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, um, 
talked around the seven bells and, yeah. um, and then you might not need to look at that as a case study of conflict. I mean I don't know about the regions and quite a lot of the languages in the east have lost the seven bells in yeah. five, which is pretty typical. Mm. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, unfortunately, you're absolutely right. So that could be another one of my contact fa- features, you know, potentially gone. Because, yeah, the idea is that it was these languages started out as seven vowel systems, and then some of them have, have lost them and have become five vowel systems. Um, so actually, maybe you want to say Ngureme is a language which has that, but it actually has coexistence. And I think people do research about uh, nouns and verbs, and actually that distinction is also not so, so odd in terms of what we like to change and what we don't like to change. In which case, yes, that's not a contact feature. The fact that it just so happens to be the case in Datoga, which is also spoken, again, is, is chance and doesn't really give you evidence in support or against. The way that they're active in the vowel harmony, I mean, as far as I know, it's like a lone vowel, you wouldn't necessarily expect to participate to, in such a hmm? process. It could be wrong, yeah. but yeah. so, for example, in Turkish, or Turkish, word starts in a strange language, like, that Yeah. No, thank you. That's yeah. It's really yeah. No. Look, look. Um, you know, there's something else very unusual about the inverse constructions, in that they look like they're destructing the verb phrase. So, like you know, in many of these examples, if you have the infinitive person, then they're still going to be object after. So, to together we will. Pairs or whatever, then the gathering of the pairs is interrupted by the auxiliary. So, so in that sense, I think it's interesting because it, mm. it looks for an explanation because it seems very disharmonic in terms of in terms of basic word order. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering about in that context is if, because this this really seems to be playing with with basic head complement relations. So, is there other evidence somewhere else in the language where this plays a role? So, you know, genitives. Mm. And have nouns or adjectives or demonstratives, um, all these sort of things. Because, because in principle, it's, it's a really nice case study to see how how basic headedness the language can change, mm. um, and it has both the context and the grammatical information structure, which then seems to result in a structure which doesn't have a rough phrase, mm-hmm. which which is weird. Mm. Uh, yeah. So in terms of in terms of sort of um, head finality, the as far as I know, no. Like as far as I know, the order of the noun demonstrative is is as expected and possessive and all sort of other things that I've come across. Um, it's certainly a good area to keep looking, especially if I'm even looking for whether I'm looking for these constructions or I'm looking for the opposite, because you want to see basically things behaving oddly. Um, and yeah, I mean, the in terms of the verb and the and the object and the relationship of the two. Um, uh, just because I know more about Rangi, in Rangi, nothing can intervene between the verb and the auxiliary, uh, with the exception of some kind of marker which shows direction, so some kind of directional particle, um, which actually seems to be more part of uh, the verb than the sort of anything else, um, in which case it does sort of show a strong phrasing together of the verb and the auxiliary, um, and again, as you've I think said, like the object being oddly kind of left. Um, it would be interesting to see if in other languages anything can intervene between those, especially because you already see on the on the verbs slightly different behaviour. So you see on the verbs some kind of a habitual marker, one of them had a, some other kind of content, continuous marker, um, whether those ones actually behave slightly differently from some of the language where it's literally an infinitive, not even necessarily with any other kind of marking, followed simply by, by the auxiliary. Um, but I uh, know certainly look for more um, of those relationships. Well, more questions. Um, out in the first 30 or so examples, with one exception, they're all in the affirmative. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, if you negated all of them, there'd be no change in the word order. So in Rangi, there would definitely be a change in the word order. Uh, in Gusi, there would also be a change in the word order in negative. No, by, by, by word order, I meant the, the verb oh, sorry. Orcs, the verb orcs. Yes. Yeah, so, so the verb orcs changes the order. Okay. Do you mean a different auxiliary being used, or do you mean the order no, no, of the... the order. Yeah, so the sequence, the ordering of that changes in Rangi, 
um, changes in Goosey, and the other ones I don't yet know. I remember what just, just mentioning that in any presentation, mm. the mixing it up a bit just to show that these are the factors as well. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they're all affirmative, there's no exception. Certainly, yeah. An obvious question here. And uh, the last one there. Uh, focus maternity <coughs> was the only example of the right language with these verb orcs order. After Christmas, <coughs> six, what happened? <coughs> well, have you missed them, or were they, uh, they, were they discovered after Christmas? Um, uh, had I missed them, um, uh, description has Fine. developed. So I was reading a, a, gram, a comparison of five of the Mara languages. So I spoke another lake, and someone said, "Oh, it's really interesting. One of these languages has an odd infinitive auxiliary order. I don't have time to go into it." And I, yeah, um, but. It's a sort of stated description and then also looking. So I was originally looking for other languages yeah. near Rangi and Mbugwe and then I found some up there. Once you're on 10, I have sensitive, so I'll let you pick them up here. Well, I hope I don't pick up any more, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so my knowledge, I'd missed them. Other people had right. not published what they'd written yet, um, combination. Right. Um, but I, hope, I don't think they've changed their word other since... In the last five years, I hope not, anyway. There weren't any Christmas stockings. <laughs> Didn't feel like it, no. <laughs> um, so, thank you for coming. I'd like to say thanks again to Hannah. Thank you very much.